series on time series databases. So we're very happy to have today Subra Goya from Two Sigma. So uh, Subra is actually a licensed cage fighter in the state of New York. Uh, and he's a little banged up from his last bout two weeks ago. Uh, so he's going to be sitting, what's that? So he's supposed to be nice? You no, know, he has to sit the whole time, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, you still see the bruises on his hand. So he's here to talk about a system that they're building internally at Two Sigma on time series databases called Smooth Storage. Um, the way to throw to think about Two Sigma is that they're like Google, uh, where they make a lot of money, but instead of making money on ads, they make money on the stock market and, and other investments. Right, so they build a lot of cool tech in-house. So he is here, he's here to talk about stuff that they're doing. Okay? All right, great. All right, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Andy. And um, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about smooth storage. It's a storage system for managing uh, time series database at Two Sigma. This is not the only system we use for storing time series database, but is one of them. Um, um, like Andy man mentioned, you know, ti uh, Two Sigma is, uh, is is a technology company really uh, in the domain of finance. Uh, that's how we look at ourselves. Um, this is sort of the standard disclaimer. I just don't take me or my talk too seriously. Don't make investments based on that. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So so this sort of the you know sort of the broad outline of the talk. Uh, I'm gonna just go into motivation why we built you know smooth storage uh, and what are some of some of its uh, design goals. Basically, you know things we try to optimize. Uh, then go into the data model in the API, and then bulk of the talk is going to be about you know the implementation of the data model and sort of the system architecture. And then um, I'll spend a little bit about. Like some of the some of the challenges we are facing, um, uh, some of the work in progress, and those kinds of things. Um, so, so smooth has been around uh, for around five years now. I've been working on smooth for the last two years. Uh, we have a dedicated team of five engineers now, uh, including me, uh, who are responsible for both uh, developing it and running it in production as a service. Um, so the basic question is, you know, why, why have a specialized storage for time series data, right? Um, so I think there are a few reasons, right? Uh, time series data is extremely common at Two Sigma and in general in the financial world. And it's not just about like raw data like prices from a stock exchange or sort of, you know, series of news articles or things like that. Um, there's a bunch of data that's generated downstream uh, is like derived uh, from other processes uh, that also makes up a big chunk of this data. Um, the other reason is time is um, invariably one of the primary dimensions along which uh, applications want to filter data and partition their workflows um, at 30 scale. Um, I mean, uh, both in terms of the amount of uh, bytes stored and also bytes accessed. Um, Smooth right now, you know, stores multiple petabytes of, you know, compressed data. Um, uh, the peak read access exceeds, you know, 100 gigabytes per second. Uh, so there's, there's lots of storage and there's lots of transfer of data. Um, and then we want to optimize for the target workload. So so our, our applications care about certain operations, uh, and so we optimize for those particular operations. Uh, they have some specific specific needs, and you know um, it's hard to find something sort of out of the box, uh, sort of in, in the open source world or the commercial world uh, that just works uh, for these requirements. At least not without spending hundred times more money, for example, right? So, um, and, and so this problem is kind of important for us, uh, and 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 so that's why we build this kind of a custom system. Um, now, so. The next question is, what, what, what is it optimizing for? Um, so Smooth is a pretty simple system, at least at this point. Um, there are really two data operations it supports. Um, the only way to write to Smooth is to actually do range updates. So actually, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, smooth 
data model is like a database. So basically, the data is organized as tables with schemas. Uh, time is a mandatory column, and uh, you know the the rows are you know ordered and indexed by time. Um, and so the two operations that we really support uh, on the right side it's uh, range updates, and the right side it's just uh, you know range queries or time uh, time ranges. And um, these operations are kind of similar uh, to uh, file system read write APIs, right? So in a file system, what you're doing, you're doing basically range updates or range accesses or byte offsets. So instead of byte offsets, we're doing it on basically you know, the, the time access or a set of rows instead of bytes. Uh, but it looks like a file system in terms of operations, but we also attach database-like semantics to those operations. For example, you know, properties like atomicity, um, or, or sort of like a isolation model for concurrent access. So, so smooth kind of sits somewhere between a file system and a database. More like a database we like to think, um, but 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 it's, it's not a pure database either. Um, uh, other than these access patterns, um, a smooth is run like a centrally managed service at Two Sigma. So it's not like people are downloading smooth and running their own clusters. I'm not going to go. Yeah, sure. So this is sort of offline time series analysis, because online it's difficult to make strong demands without risking dropping data. Uh, it, well, so it's, 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 it's tuned for bulk access, but you can do parallel updates. So the arriving data yes. can come too fast for a system with strong semantics. Uh, I'll get into that. So I, I don't think that's a problem with smooth. Uh, the system guarantees it, or you just ensure the users make sure that there's more than enough capability? Well, the thing is, if you, if you have a very aggressive user coming at you. Yeah. No. Well, is that a, you think of ingest as a, from a user? Yes, from a user. OK. All right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what we are doing here is it's definitely not uh, targeted towards high transaction loads, for sure. I was thinking the time series usually come from uh, some kind of abstract sensor, and those things are driven by some source other than they slow down. They don't slow down with you. So this is an excellent question. So yes, in that repeat the question for the mic. Yes. So so the question is, um, uh, it, it, does this database keep up with you know it, you know IoT type you know sources which which don't stop essentially right? You can't stop them. There's like metrics and IoT data coming at you, and you can can you keep up with that? Uh, so, so I think I misunderstood your question. Yes, so smooth is really for offline. So it's not for online sources ingesting data from from them on a streaming, you know, in a streaming fashion. Um, what happens really in smooth is, you know, you, you could have things like suppose prices from stock exchange, right? And and we could get those prices at the end of the day, right? And you can bulk upload them, uh, and the, and then do your queries on it later on, for example. Um, um, so, so yes. Yeah, I talked to BNP Paribas once, and they had yeah. a model of uh, during the night they reorganized the database, and during the day they did analysis on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's not that offline. Yeah, but 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 what happens is a lot of data in smooth is not just raw data. So what happens is you could have these bulk processes that happen in the at the end of the day. But then there are processes that run throughout the day, which actually use those input sets and transform them and produce new sets, yeah. and constantly writing back into Smooth as new data sets and so on. Um, uh, but yes, so this is this is not something which is tuned for uh, metrics. This is not a metrics database, right? So this is in a metrics database is basically you have the stream of events coming at you mostly in time order, right? Um, and they're mostly very narrow tables, right? You, you have like CPU utilization or whatever, right? Uh, this is not meant for that. This is more for the, the the primary use case for Smooth and Two Sigma is to support the modeling research workflow, uh, which is so we have modelers uh, who are basically creating some kind of model to predict prices in the future, for example, right? So so they are building predictive models based on some base data. So 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 it could involve things like oh you know what I have this idea and it's going to use satellite images or whatever. So the process is you know getting that data into the system and then doing lots of iterative analysis on top of it. And then and then once it says oh well this idea looks like promising it may go through some rigorous simulations of 
you know, real market-like conditions to see whether the data, you know, the idea actually works and so on. So this is sort of the basic use case for Smooth. People also build like data pipelines and they also store raw data and those kinds of things. So, um, all right. So, so coming back to to the uh, to the slide where um, so it's it's run as a as a as a centrally managed service at Two Sigma. I'm not going to go into the details of why that's a good idea, uh, but what that means for us is there's much higher expectations around sort of the availability and the durability and the reliability of the service. And this is these are one of these are some of the practical concerns we spend a lot of time on, and and. Running a shared service also means that you have problems like multi-tenancy, so lots of users coming at you, and how do you, how do you, um, you know, how do you control like fair sharing of resources across them, right? And what's your access control model and the security and all of that? Um, and lastly, but not the least, uh, since Smooth stores a lot of data, um, it's important for us to store that efficiently. So. We employ things like storage tiering and compression and those kinds of things to, to help with that. Um, this is sort of a high level summary of what kind of applications really use Smooth. They tend to be you know, parallel time partition jobs uh, that do big I.O. So this is not a system for doing lots of small I.O. Uh, so it's, it's, more, it's more to scale uh, the bandwidth rather than sort of the transaction rate, if you will. Um, and so they care more about throughput rather than you know, latency of a particular operation. Um, now that said, uh, we are getting new use cases where people actually care about latency and, and they are running more interactive workloads on it uh, and they're doing smaller queries on it and so on. So uh, in the future, Smooth could evolve. Uh, so, so. All right, so I already discussed sort of the high-level data model. You know, we have tables with schema and a time column. The rows are ordered and indexed by time. The smooth tables are non-relational. Uh, basically, you can have two rows with the same timestamp. Uh, in fact, you can have two rows identical and doesn't really care. Uh, so this is sort of like the file systems style semantics it has. Um, uh, it's easy to update schema. Uh, you know, you could you could you could easily add new columns or or, or hide existing columns. Uh, we also support wide sparse schemas efficiently. This is sort of a case which is a lot of those metrics databases don't care about this because uh, the tables are pretty narrow. Um, we can get very very broad tables with tens of thousands of columns uh, and, and and a lot of them containing nothing. So it's pretty sparse and so. Uh, we have an encoding that 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 is pretty efficient. Um, um, so this is the write API. Uh, so as I as I mentioned before, the the only way to write to Smooth uh, is to update a given time range, uh, and and that operation is atomic. Um, so uh, it basically uh, overwrites the existing set of rows belonging to the given time range and replaces them with a new set of rows. So you can think of this operation as basically you're doing a bulk delete followed by a bunch of inserts atomically. Uh, this is sort of the operation that a lot of our workflows needed, and so we just optimize directly for this operation. Um, so here's like a little pseudocode. Um, you know, you, you start a write by supplying it the time range you want to overwrite, and then you get like a you know write session object. You start adding rows. Um, rows have to be added in non-decreasing time order, uh, because as you add rows, they're actually streamed directly to the one, uh, to, to some storage backend, some, some object store. Uh, so you can actually stream lots of data, and, and there's very little buffering on the client side. Um, and so the restriction there is you, the, the rows have to be in, in non-decreasing time order, and, and, and you have to make sure that the, you don't add something that's out of the original time range you supplied. And then at the end, um, if everything goes well, you can commit it. And so this whole operation is atomic that way, uh, or you can abort it if, if something goes wrong. Um, internally, what we do is we, we assign a, a strictly monotonically increasing logical timestamp to each write. Uh, and so the, the metadata internally is totally linear. So if you look at the set of all writes uh, going to a particular smooth table, uh, there's a total order. So the latest 
the latest uh, write always wins, essentially. Um, uh, there is a, a sort of a more general version of this API, where, for example, if you want to actually update multiple ranges on the table and you want to update them atomically, uh, that's also possible. In fact, if you are updating lots of data and you want to actually have multiple processes updating different time ranges of the same table, and you want to publish the whole chain atomically, you can do that as well. Um, um, one thing to point out is delete just becomes a special case of this API. So if you want to delete a time range, all you have to do is uh, don't write any new rows and just commit, right? And so that, that, that range of the table is going to be deleted. How, how, I mean, how common is it that people know their ranges ahead of time? In your case, you have to know, right? Yes, yes, yes. How limiting is it that they yeah. must know? Well, what happens is a lot of times they have an input data set, right? And, and they partition it. And they kind of know sort of the ranges they are actually processing. And so ahead of time, they know that the output is going to be in this range, essentially. So it's kind of like. But lo suppose what yeah. I was doing is an analysis, and I was saying, you know, I'm interested in a pattern where a particular thing that was being measured as a data column went through this particular pattern, plus or minus some percentage. That'd be a search on the non-index time range. Would be a complete scan. Yes. Do you do secondary indices? Uh, we don't currently, but we do have some challenging workloads that I'll talk about. Okay. Uh, so, so right now, yes. So in those cases, all you can do is filter by time and you just do a do a scan, essentially. Yeah. So, I mean, so this is essentially doing application level partitioning. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Well, you said the user is not allowed the primary index, but the timestamp is the primary index, right? In your head. Uh, so you, are, are you saying? Um, in, in the previous page, you said uh, uh, the database has no primary index. No, no, no. So what I said was um, the database does not enforce primary key constraint. What basically means is, if users want to add two rows with the same timestamp, uh -huh. it's okay. OK. But we do support indexing on this non-unique value internally. Yeah. yeah, so we have indexing, but we don't support like uh, primary key constraints. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to go into details. There are ways where applications, if they really want, they can do it. Okay. Uh, they have to be a little disciplined. Uh, um, but but it's, it's, that's not the primary uh, objective. Oh. Yeah. Um, all right, so reads. Uh, so the reads, uh, we basically support snapshot reads. Uh, what that basically means is you know, the, the rows returned are based on the latest committed view of the table at the start of the read operation. So you, you, do a, you, read, you start a read operation. At the start of the read operation, it basically latches onto a view of the table based on the latest commit that has happened. And then any concurrent re uh, writes that happen while the read is going on does not affect uh, the, the, the set of rows re returned. So uh, it, this is kind of easy because we have a linear sort of metadata, and you know there's a total order on the right. So we just have to cut out any new writes with higher timestamps. And so uh, that there is a little bit of interference with the compaction process that I'll talk about, but but that's how it works. Um, so this is like a little pseudocode. All you do is you know you have to read, you supply a time range, and um, you get an iterator of rows. And and at this point, you're basically directly going to some object store, uh, you know, which actually contains the set of rows, um, and, and just streaming from there. Um, uh, analogous to distributed writes, uh, you can also share the same committed view of the table across multiple processes if you want. Um, there are some other operations that are not officially supported, but it's something we are thinking about, uh, and it's kind of a natural fit for smooth. Uh, things like snapshots or sort of time travel, so bitemporal access. So if you want to go back and say, how did my table look like like yesterday at 2 PM, right? And, and not include all the writes that happened since. Um, it's relatively easy to support. We don't support it yet, but it's definitely easy to support it if you bound the time window. If you want unbounded edit history for the table, uh, I think that will require large changes. Uh, really? Uh, Is this turn off garbage collection? 
Yeah, but then our metadata blows up, and you know we we, we not we, we have not built to scale the metadata to to, to those levels. Um, um, but 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 one thing to mention is that we do have an older system uh, in our archival file system at Two Sigma, which actually supports that out of the box. So, but it doesn't have a database like API. It's like a file system API where every edit you do um, is maintained as a version. So you can go back and trace the edit history if you wanted to. Uh, this is something we might add to Smooth as well. Um, um, and the little thing is, like, you know, if someone really, really wants to do some you know, atomic uh, read, modify, writes, uh, I think it's going to be relatively easy to support that based on optimistic concurrency control on the commit time. So, yeah. Sorry, just to make sure, I mean, if you want to read a range of data, yeah. so you have to like, uh, scan from the last data added to the like, earlier data, right? A kind of scan. I'm a little confusing because it's a little confusing because I mean from the last slide we talked about like there's kind of Snapchat read, uh, read. Snapchat read. So what does that mean? Yes, yeah, snapshot read just means that. So, so so it basically when it starts the read operation, it basically locks to a static view of the table as it existed, right? And then any new operation that happened while the read is happening don't interfere. Yeah, this is a classic problem that with a, if you were to read a database one row at a, at a time and extract all the data while yeah. it's actively being inserted and deleted, yeah. you'd get a picture of the universe that never existed. It's like a copy on write. Sounds well, copy on write is one implementation strategy. What yeah. you're really talking about is a consistency. Yes, it's a consistent. One day point in time, so all the data values actually existed in the database. Exactly. So, so it's always going to return you a consistent view of the table. It's not going to return your rows, you know, half from this commit and half from the other. Take fifteen seven twenty one next semester. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the only place that talks about consistency. It, 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 it's not the only place, but it's the best place. To go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah but, but by the way, we, we we use SQL Server for storing lots of metadata, and and you know, you know, we don't use asset, you know, fully serializable uh, transactions because you know because of performance and all those reasons. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> Each row, uh, so if you write in the future, that's going to be a separate row, like by the time stamp. So you just, uh, you just don't read after, uh, after a point. Exactly, exactly. That's a good way to think about it. Is you can say, well, I'm not going to read any writes that happened after this logical timestamp. Yeah. Right. Uh, and as long as all the old data is static, I'm fine. Yeah. It's actually not static, but. We, we manage it in a way where it, 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 it's, it's semantically static, essentially. Uh, why, why is it not static? Because well, because we also do compactions, which can actually merge some existing data that was written in the past uh, into a new set of files and so on. And so while it is happening and you're doing the read, you want to make sure that you don't miss anything. Okay, but that's a physical sort of uh, change, not a logical change. It actually also is a logic. I'll get into the details um, of, of how, it, how it works and makes sense then. Um, <coughs> okay. So now this is sort of the uh, you know getting in the, into the into the details of how we actually implement this API and kind of scale it. And and um, so at a very high level, if I had to like give you like two bullet points of how the implementation looks like. At a very high level, it looks like a log structured merge tree, uh, but it's like specialized for bulk deletes. Because we think like every write operation that happens carries with itself, you know, it, within it, a bulk delete operation, essentially. And so we kind of structure the whole metadata around it. Um, the other thing is, this may be obvious, but, but you know, databases extract away some of the physical details. But we have an implementation where the implement itself has a clean separation between sort of the physical properties of the data and the semantic properties of the implementation. So it'll make more sense when I discuss it. So, um, and that why we did that is to to allow kind of flexibility at the data layer, so that we can actually choose a different object store, uh, federate multiple object stores, you know, use different file formats as you can. Uh, you know, better indices and better compression and so on, and not have to touch most of the code while doing that. Um, um, 
So okay, so this this is sort of the one of the most important pictures um, of of how the, ta the the table internally looks like. Uh, so a range update internally is represented by metadata objects called shards. And a useful way to visualize these shards is to place them in this two-dimensional plane, where on the y-axis you have the commit time. This is the time you get, this is the logical time you get every time you write to the table. And then on the x-axis you, the, you have the values on the time column. So essentially, for example, you know, shard two has C2 as the commit time and has an associated time range uh, that was overwritten, right? Um, now, each shard also points to a, a, an immutable data file, which contains the new set of rows that were written as part of that operation. Right? So the time range here is not an envelope over the new set of rows. The time range here is the range that was overwritten. Um, and the new set of rows go into this data file, which is in some object store. Right? Um, the data file is immutable, write once, uh, it has the rows ordered by time and indexed, um, and it can be potentially replicated. So if there's some table, uh, you know, we want to replicate it across data center or multiple sites, uh, you know, you could have multiple replicas, of essentially. Uh, and so, so the property of the shards is they're semantically mutable, right? Um, you know, it never changes, it never changes the commit time, it never changes the time range. Uh, and it always returns the same set of rows, right? So any process that's working at the level of shard, they don't care about the physical details. I mean, we could actually move these files to some other object store. We could rewrite the files in a different format. We could use a different compression. We could even have two replicas with two different file formats, depending on, you know, we could, we could, we could depending on the workload, we could use one or the other, right? Um, so, so they kind of determine sort of the performance and sort of locality aspects, but the semantics aspect, semantic aspects are basically remain the same, right? As long as you are dealing with the same set of shards. Um, Typically, how big is a shard in your world? Uh, we, we, we like it to be 100 MB. Okay. 100 MB, 150 MB, even larger. Uh, so, so typically these data files, they, they actually, we use HDFS for, um, for the warm data, and, and HDFS internally sort of chunks these files into 64 MB pieces. And so if you have a large table, what happens is essentially all the data for the table is kind of spread across the whole fleet of storage nodes. And so it allows us to scale the bandwidth on these hard tables very nicely that way. Um, um, another way to look at these shards is you can think of them as carriers of bulk delete tombstones. So you're essentially doing a bulk delete and with a bunch of inserts, but we don't really actively carry out the bulk delete operation. We just tag it, right? It was, this range was deleted, don't do anything about it. Just keep it in the metadata, right? Um, so, um, yeah, yes. Yes. So if I only update one row, you will generate a separate shard for it? That's a great question. So smooth is really not built for lots of small writes. Okay. Yes. So, so if you if yeah, if you throw that kind of workload at it, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be very hard for it. Okay. Yeah. So you anticipate a large update. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. The F like two time range overlap. Uh, does it mean you have like data? Excellent question. So if, if two shards overlap, which basically means that the overlap portion mm -hmm. is owned by the most recent shard, oh, okay. right? So because it overwrote it. So essentially it's, it's hiding that portion, that time range in shard one, for example. And so in theory that can be garbage collected unless you want to do time travel and stuff like that. Yeah. And so this will become very clear in the next slide, actually. So, so, so the next slide is about how do we actually do reads on this kind of metadata, right? So, so we support snapshot reads, and so uh, what that basically means is um, when we start the read operation, right, um, we look at all the shards that intersect with the given time range, right? 
And then looking at all those shards from the top, we look for all the visible subranges of those shards. Right? For example, in this case, if you did a read after the third write, all the pieces, all the subranges in dark gray are the ones that are visible essentially. Right? And so the rows corresponding to those subranges will be streamed back. If that makes sense. Um, and so we call this a read plan essentially. A read plan is essentially basically we concatenate together these visible subranges and and and, and stream it. Um, now the underlying data files are ordered ordered by time and, and indexed, so extracting out those rows for those subranges is relatively efficient. Um, um, and, 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 and of course, you know, while we're doing that, you know, any, any, any concurrent writes that happen you know, don't affect the read plan. So, so this is, um, so in, in, in a way, if you think about it, you know, if you compare it to say LSM or something like that, um, which also has a log structured, you know, this is a log structured metadata essentially, and, and these shards are kind of like SS tables, right? Um, but unlike LSM, because we are optimizing for these bulk deletes, for us it's, it's always possible to know which shard owns a particular timestamp. So you don't have to like, um, Sort of, sort of merge at the at, at the row levels to 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 get that answer. So, um, um, this is sort of the underlying uh, format of the data files. It's a pretty simple format. It looks like a static two-level, you know, B tree. So there's a single index block, uh, which points to a sequence of contiguous data blocks. Um, each data block is individually compressed. It's, it's of the order of a few megabytes. Uh, and so that means that even if you're reading a single row, this is the unit of read. So you have to go and decompress this multi-megabyte um, block to be able to do that. Um, for most of our data, we use LZ4. It gives us 2x compression with very low overhead. Uh, we've used gzip as well for uh, some of the core data. Uh, there, there's other stuff we have done that I'll, that I'll talk about later uh, for you know laying it out in column major formats and getting more compression, so on that. Um, but but so this is this is um, this is how it looks. Um, and then you know com coming to compaction. So wh why do we need compaction, right? And so um, it's exactly for this reason. So if you have a read plan here like this, uh, and if the subranges become too small, right, because of uh, overlapping writes or lots of small writes. Uh, that means we are doing lots of small IOs. And lots of small IOs means you know, the reads become slow. Uh, it can lead to more disk seeks, for example, on our backing stores. And so uh, that's, that's a bad thing for, for scaling the system or for performance. And so what we want to do is basically defragment our read plans. So uh, basically rewrite portions of the read plan where you have lots of small uh, subranges. Uh, the second reason is um, if you have lots of small writes, um, that means your metadata is pretty large. Um, you have lots of shards in the smooth metadata. On HDFS, you have lots of inodes. Um, uh, and you know, eventually on the ext 4 we have lots of inodes, and everything is you know, dominated by inodes. And um, it's not good for scalability either. Um, most of the things we are using, they don't like lots of, lots of tiny files. Uh, so we want to manage. Uh, such that we have a high ratio of data to metadata. And so that's another reason behind compaction. And the third is obviously garbage collection. So you could have, you could have files and shards that are completely hidden, and they're just taking up space. So we can just get rid of them. Um, so the compaction process is, as, is pretty simple. Um, it it's basically does what the read does, essentially. It, 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 it creates a read plan for the entire time range. So it essentially says, if I have to read the whole table, can you return me uh, the read plan for it, right? All the subranges that are visible. And then it walks and looks at portions that have more fragmentation. And then just rewrites them with a single large shard, essentially. Uh, now, there's a, there's a huge limitation with this algorithm, 
which is if you have a small shard here and a large shard here and a small shard here, you can't just take these two small shards and combine them because what is the time range you'll, you'll pick for the whole new shard, right? Because it's a large right amplification. Exactly. Right amplification. Um, right, right, right amplification. So in theory, for certain kinds of workloads, if you're doing lots of small writes, this can be horrible in terms of write amplification. But what we have seen is in practice, it's less than 10. And that's mostly because the workload tends to be you know, big writes. Uh, so in the future, if it, if it turns out that the, the write, write workload becomes more challenging, we'll be probably have to do something more. Uh, but right now, we are okay with simple algorithm like this. Um, now, and yeah, once, 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 once we have the new shard, the one more detail about the new shard is we want to make sure that the, the sequence, the right order is still maintained. So, so when we combine, for example, these three shards and replace it with this big shard on the top, we actually reuse the commit time of shard three, right? And that way, we make sure that the right order is maintained and it's not interfering with any ongoing writes that, like shard four. So, we, so it's essentially reads in the past. It actually updates shards in the past uh, to maintain that order. Um, um, uh, small little detail when we actually delete these, uh, these underlying shards, we don't delete the underlying data files directly because you could have ongoing reads happening uh, that still reference it. So we actually delete the underlying data files a week after uh, just to make sure the reads are not affected. Um, but I mean, you're just guessing that no, nothing's reading a week later. You are right. Okay. Right. So, so, so a week is like an upper bound. So if, if you started a read, you better finish within a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Okay, so I, I think this is something I already talked about. Uh, there's some similarities with LSM. Um, both are log structured. Uh, you know, immutable shards with indexed, you know, data files are similar to SS tables. They both have compaction process aimed at similar objectives. Um, but there's a difference in the detail. Uh, you know, we are optimizing for bulk delete. Um, so essentially, the whole thing is optimized around handling the bulk deletes efficiently. Uh, and so we defer handling them till the compaction time, and the whole read algorithm kind of adapts around it and so on. Um, uh, and, and, and I think you know, a key value stores that, 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 that have to optimize bulk deletes you know, can do something similar. Right? They can embed something like this into the SS tables uh, and, and not, not have to actually carry it out by enumerating keys and so on. Um, and write application. So as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, in theory, this could the, the, the compaction algorithm can 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 lead to very high write amplification. But we just monitor it. Um, it's not been bad in practice. Um, now, if it does get more challenging, uh, I, I think we have a path forward for it. You know, um, multi-level compaction. Uh, we can use something like that. But then it changes the metadata because then we'll have to actually push down the sh the shard abstraction into the data files. Because now you have disjoint ranges inside the same data file because you're combining two non-adjacent shards, essentially. Right? And so the read, the read algorithm also becomes a little more complex. It starts looking like an LSM, where you have to now merge the read plans from multiple levels together and so on. Um, so this is something, this is a complexity we're avoiding right now. Uh, if, it, if it becomes hard, we'd probably do something like that in the future. Um, High compared to V trees? Well, yeah. <laughs> but I thought that was sort of their selling point. They write initially very fast. The compaction process, depending on the key range that they're written. Well, it depends. It allows you to do the trade off, right? So, depending on sort of the size ratio between the two tiers and the number of tiers you have. Yeah, but on you can, you can, you can tune, you can tune the write amplification uh, versus sort of the read performance, right? So because of the size ratio, so assume random distribution of keys, and, uh, then whenever you want to compact uh, a megabyte yeah. into the next layer down, you're going to read 10 megabytes, yes. put them into 11, and write them back as 11. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 so yes. Accomplished uh, compacting one megabyte at the cost of 11 megabytes. Yes, but if you have like a B tree and you have like 10,000 keys per data block, 
and you're doing like random, you know, writes to it, the amplification could be like 10,000 or whatever, right? Um, Obviously, that works, but yeah, there, yeah, that problem exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I would emphasize that this structure that we have is not really for optimizing write amplification. We don't have that problem. Right. The, the, the reason we have this structure really is because it's a really simple to reason about, because things are immutable. I can replicate those data files and cache them without you know, worrying about you know, consistency problems. And, and I can have like, you know, all this concurrent happening, right? Um, you know, reads and writes from the users, the compaction process, and something else moving the data around because since things are immutable, it's very easy for us to reason about concurrency and the correctness of the system. So that, that is sort of the driving goal. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so this is just a sort of zooming out kind of a messy picture about sort of the runtime components of Smooth. Um, um, we store the Smooth metadata in Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, that's, uh, that's on the top right part of this diagram. Uh, it, it gets replicated to other backup servers living in other remote data centers. We have stateless servers that mediate access to this database. Um, at the bottom, you have these object stores. We use HDFS for sort of the warm, for warm data and CellFS, which is an internal two sigma system, an archival file system for cold data. Um, it's smooth uh, because of the shard abstraction, um, can actually easily integrate multiple different kinds of object stores. Uh, it can federate multiple object stores, for example, for scaling, um, for replication, for, for tiering, and so on. Um, Smooth has a client library that applications need to link to in order to access Smooth. That's the thing on the left top. And, um, and basically, the client, client library basically orchestrates the whole API uh, between the metadata and the data layers. Um, the one thing that I, I, I mentioned, but you know, there's, there's, there's these things called data movers. Uh, so we have a, like a policy-based uh, data movement framework. So for each shard, you can say, well, I want a copy of this shard in some other data center. Oh, this, oh, this shard has become too cold. Why not just move it to CellFS? And while you're moving it, maybe rewrite it and compress it using GZIP and so on, right? And as long as you can do it in a way where there's always one copy present for that shard, no one cares. They can see performance issues, but it's like seamless to the, to the layers above it. Um, um, I think. I already chatted about all of this, so I think this as well, you know, immutability is, is one of the design principles we have been using, and it has been um, really useful for us because, you know, it's, it's, it makes it much easier for us to reason about the system. There's very less coordination needed by different processes, whether internal or external, uh, in order to reason about the correctness and sort of the consistency of the tables and so on. Uh, so that has been a big win for us. Um, um, these are some high-level statistics. I, I think I, I, I already mentioned, I, you know, we have multiple petabytes of unique compressed data. Uh, we have read peaks in excess of 100 gigabyte, gigabytes per second. Uh, we have uh, tens of millions of files and shards. We have uh, hundreds of millions of uh, you know, files and shards and tens of millions of tables. Uh, tens of thousands of concurrent requests. This this doesn't seem like a big number, but but um, it's it's m the, the whole system is is more about scaling the bandwidth rather than concurrency as much. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah. People are researchers here looking for problems. So yeah. if you started from here and said, uh, what what would you recommend? What are the hard problems you would recommend that people might want to innovate? Not because two sigma needs it. Yeah. Now, yeah that you would think would be interesting things to do in this space? Oh, definitely. And so by the way, so Smooth is just addressing a, sm a, 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 a part of the workload that Two Sigma needs in terms of time series databases, right? So this is not a system used by trading systems, for example, right, where they might care about much more complex queries, they might actually care about low latencies, so there could be lots of server-side you know, computation happening. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those systems directly in this talk, but I'm going to actually talk about 
some of the interesting queries that people are asking us to solve. Uh, and, and I'm going to just give you that problem. Okay. And, and, and maybe if that, the problem already has a good solution, then great for us. Uh, uh, so, so I'm going to talk about that in the, in, in the next section. Okay. Yeah. So, um, OK, so sort of looking forward, right? I mean, what are the things we are working at? What are the problems we are solving right now? So Two Sigma's data uh, infrastructure is spread across multiple data centers. And it's also using public cloud for some of, some of its uh, compute. And so one of the common problems is, oh, I want to access this table, right, from anywhere, from any data center, right? And, and I shouldn't care about it. Uh, so replicating data to all the data centers is, is not a good solution. It's not cost effective, right? So, so what we're looking for is kind of like a distributed CDN style caching layer, right? Um, that, that can span multiple data centers, but does not require storing data at rest, right? So, so there's a new object store we are kind of investing in, which has this, uh, this, this CDN-like caching layer uh, that we may use for scaling the reads, essentially. Um, st improving storage efficiency is an, is an important goal for us. Uh, you know, we, we store a bunch of data. We are growing fast. And so what we did this summer, we had an intern come in and actually try out some open source columnar formats like you know, Apache Parquet and ORC. Uh, on a big set of smooth data and see what we, you know, what we find. And so not surprisingly, uh, we get another like 25, 30% better compression over gzip. Um, so this is something we can maybe do in the future. Uh, we have an interesting file format uh, developed within Two Sigma, which is actually row-oriented, but it actually allows you to specify codec per column. So it actually compresses individual columns, but lays down data row-oriented. Um, and so for, for people who don't care about column filtering, uh, that can be much faster uh, and still gives you pretty good compression and so on. So it's something we, can, we may look into in the future. I, I'll be happy to talk about so the details of that file format if you want after the talk. Uh, well, but that is another angle we're looking at. Um, we also want to make replication and tiering more cost efficient, right? So right now, we don't have an object store that actually understands cross data center semantics properly. Uh, so you know, handling a, handling a disk failure or a, or a node failure is different than handling a data center level failure, right? Uh, you want to have different semantics. And so what we are doing right now is sometimes we actually replicate data across two HDFS clusters sitting in two different data centers, right? And that's, that's not cost effective at all because you know, HDFS internally makes three copies of any data we put in. So we have like six copies, right? Which is not great. Uh, so, so we're looking at other solutions where the object store itself has the right semantics for cross data center replication. And it uses things like erasure coding and so on, right? So, so it's like a lot more cost effective and so on. So, so we're looking at those areas. Um, um, there's a bullet I, I didn't mention here. I, I mean, performance is also a problem. Although we are throughput oriented, uh, HDFS tends to have very bad tail latencies for lots of reasons. Uh, I can get into the details of, of why that's the case. And, and we're not very happy about that. So we want some kind of performance consistency. And so that's a problem that, that's going to be challenging for us to solve. Um, um, so other than that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there are people who are also demanding some more challenging um, read site filtering or querying. So right now, all they get is range filtering on time. Um, so there are some people who care about, say, column filtering, uh, which may not be that hard uh, to support. Uh, but there are other complex queries that they want to support. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. And this is a query which we don't know how to solve in a very good way. So we have, good, so we have some ideas around it, but we're not like, sold that this is the right way to do it. Um, so what happens is a lot of our time series data actually has sub-series within it. So for example, if I'm getting prices from a stock exchange, right? So I'm getting prices from Google and Apple and other companies all together, ordered by time. So, 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 the, so the data sets really looks like, oh, it's all ordered by time, but there's another column, which is sort of the stock ticker or the company, right? And then the kinds of queries people want to do on these data sets is, I'm going to give you an arbitrary subset of the other column. So the other column can have cardinality of around 10K or 20K. 
say, a number of companies listed in you know, some exchange. And I'm going to give you any random, not random, but any arbitrary subset of those names. And you have to pick just those rows and return them ordered by time. Right? It's kind of like a subset query. Uh, and this is actually pretty common uh, at to Sigma. Uh, and, and if you think about like solving it using like traditional database indices, like like having like a clustered index on the time and then a secondary index sort of on the other column, the problem is like each data block represents almost all the tickers. Not all, but maybe 80% of all the you know all, all all the all the companies. And so you essentially are doing essentially table scan at that point, even though you have uh, a secondary index, because you have to just pull that data block and filter all the rows out. Uh, the other way to do this is, oh, I'm going to have an index. I'm going to separate out um, the data set by the company ID. right? And so the, the first component of your clustered index is actually the company ID. And then what you can do is, oh, now I can do, you know, the, uh, you know I can select the right set of rows and then just merge them. The problem is you're actually inducing lots of random I.O. When the, when, when the, if you're trying to select everything, for example, right? So you're basically doing I.O. from 10,000 different pieces and then trying to merge all these 10,000 streams, right? And when you think about sequential I.O., are you thinking about uh, in memory? Are you thinking about on the same node? Or are you thinking on the same disk? Are you really thinking, like, like he doesn't believe that there's any disk I.O. anymore, so everything's in memory. Well, I think our data sets don't, don't fit in memory at all. He's, he's out on HDFS. Yeah. He so, doesn't know what disk it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you are really, when you talk about sequentiality, you mean when you launch a seek, yes. how much useful data do you get? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's basically spread across a bunch of disks, essentially. And it's like 64 MB pieces. Who knows where it's lying? Um, is the data really that big? It's just time series. Uh, I mean, what, what else do you store with these these tickets, right? Well, well, the thing is, the thing is this, right? Well, it's it's, it's, it's it's not just raw it's not just raw data. Yeah. What people do is they say, oh, I have this these rows coming from you know this market data, right? I'm going to do something on it and derive another data set. So you're going to get lots of copies of the data, uh, in different formats and different It, it's not the same. It's not a copy, really, right? It's it's read data out, transform it, shove it back in, and make, that's a new copy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's derived. Yeah. It's derived. Yeah. Um, but you, you don't have you don't have video. You don't have really big data. You have what others would call metadata. Well, uh, yeah, there are people. There, there, yeah, there are people in the company who are looking at satellite images and looking at news articles yeah, and do satellite images. Yeah. So, so the thing is, yeah, I mean, people are looking at any kind of data that they can use to correlate some future event. So you can afford a thousand node cluster, and if you had all the memory of a thousand node cluster, you could see keep a lot of time series data in memory. Well, the thing is. The lots of data sets. Then it's not like there's a single data set we can just load everything. So, so, so every researcher at Two Sigma has his own favorite thing, right? He's he's trying out something, and he has his own, okay. you know, prepared data set, and 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 he's banging on that. Um, um, so, so I think keeping the whole thing in memory is is kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Great yeah. Yeah. So, so it, is it really disk, or do you, would you consider the same problem being in Flash? Just the fact that I think Flash, access. Flash definitely helps, yeah. because you know you could reduce the sort of the page size that itself it reduces the read amplification, right? So indices can become a little more effective. So now you can take those ten Ks and shard them some, uh, yeah. even if you did it with a hash, so that you would be getting a. Subset, yeah, and, and, and you don't care about seeks anymore because you have so much of parallelism available, right? It's still the effect of a seek. Yeah. Getting that page out has a latency called by bandwidth, but yeah. 
Yeah, but you can do that in parallel, right? These flash drives are pretty parallel. So. What do you do with disk in parallel too? So. Not a single disk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I think th there's another problem, right? I mean, the the merge itself can be non-trivial, because if you're doing merge on time, right, it's essentially a conditional branch that cannot be predicted, right? And 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 CPU suck at you know when when you do, when they can't predict you know branches, and so doing general merges where you have to actually compare each row and you don't know which way you're gonna go. Um, can, can be bad for for CPU intensive, you know, workloads. So, it's it's not just a disk. I'm saying essentially, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Do you have a retention policy for all the old shards? Are they eventually lost uh, after compaction? Uh, you mean the shards that cannot be read anymore? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there have been people who said that never delete my data, right? And they want it for audit purposes and so on. But this is really not, right now, we are not built for that because our metadata just increases without bound, right? Um, so, so generally, we don't support those use cases where you cannot get rid of data at all. Yeah. All right, let's thank him again. Yeah.